Um, I'm Catherine Woodhouse Byer. I'm the Assistant Director uh, for the Program in Cultural Heritage and Preservation Studies. Um, I'm also a lecturer in the Anthropology Department and the Art History Departments as well here at Rutgers. Um, welcome, or welcome back, uh, to the Saturday afternoon session of our Cultural Landscapes Conference. Um, we've had another busy morning uh, with a keynote address on preserving cultural landscapes, a panel on new approaches and policy framework, and a case study on historic cities um, of Asia. We are delighted to see so much interaction and exchange during the comment sessions and also during the various breaks um, of, of the day. This is what conferences are all about, exchanges, collaborations, as well as dialogues. We now arrive at panel four, cultural landscape management from the ground up. I'm extremely honored to introduce our moderator, Jane Lennon, uh, who has a very impressive uh, biography um, as pertaining to uh, her work in cultural heritage and cultural landscapes. Um, just a quick few highlights. Jane is a founding member of Australia ECOMOS and also one of its past presidents. She is um, a former um, ECROM council member um, and also um, an, an Australian heritage counselor. Jane also worked with the Cultural Heritage Center on cultural landscape management guidelines, which were published by UNESCO in 2010. So let's please welcome Jane, our moderator, who will also introduce us to the panelists. Thank you, Catherine. Our panel is really concerned about on-ground management. Um, we're taking a look at where we've gone since Ferrara. There were challenges given to us in the Ferrara Declaration, which you all have, and we're very concerned to look at the issues on the ground. Um, the people in the panel have been subject to some bossy emails from me <laughs> with lots of questions they might consider. Um, they've come up with their own twists and turns on things. But I think the major issues we are looking at is community involvement in managing the cultural landscape um, as a living working landscape. We're looking at the problem of setting limits of acceptable change, acceptable to who? Those communities, state authorities, um, when there are new developments that might impact on the resilient landscape. And finally, we're looking at developing partnerships. So these are sort of the, the big issues we were hoping our panellists would consider. We have five panellists this afternoon. Um, and I will introduce each panellist as they speak. I think that's easier. And we're going to go in the order of presentation um, as in your program. So our first panellist is Susan Dolan. Susan is the manager of the Cultural Landscapes Program for the US National Park Service. And so she brings us a lot of experience in um, the Park Service's application of the concept. Um, I'm not going, I'm just having one short word about each person because you must read the bios um, in the notes. Some of them are slightly out of date, but they do tell you what everybody has been doing. So let's please welcome Susan. Thank you very much, Jane. And it's an honor to be here in front of you. And thank you so much, Archer and Rutgers University. So I am the manager of the Park Cultural Landscapes Program for the National Park Service. And I'm going to be speaking about innovations in managing National Park Service cultural landscapes from the ground up. For more than 100 years, the National Park Service has set aside cultural landscapes in a diverse array of enabling legislation and management scenarios. Most of the 398 national parks have cultural landscapes. And the National Park Service mission and policies call for their preservation in perpetuity. For the National Park Service, this means perpetuating the historic character of the landscape despite the inevitable effects of change and the loss of traditionally associated people. Many parks are owned fee simple by the National Park Service and early legislation was often written narrowly to set aside land in commemoration of a singular event, person, or natural wonder. 
But since the recognition of cultural landscapes by the MPS in the 1980s, park legislation now tends to identify multiple values, including the association of traditional cultures and historic uses of the land, along with other natural, cultural, and recreational values. And I'd like to examine the diverse management scenarios for national parks, cultural landscapes, and explore tools that enable the National Park Service to return traditional cultures and historic uses to cultural landscapes. These tools have a direct effect on management from the ground up and may present the best chances for landscape preservation in perpetuity. The National Park Service philosophic framework for cultural landscape management is based upon managing change within defined parameters, rather than attempting to prevent change. The parameters of acceptable change are identified in management plans that guide staff in planning on the ground activities, such as cycles of pruning, mowing, cultivating, harvesting, burning, and structural repairs. Management plans include cultural landscape inventories, for example, on your left up here. They identify significance and historic character to be preserved. And cultural landscape reports, you'll see an example on your right, that provide a blueprint for future treatment and maintenance. Treatment plans follow National Park Service standards, which are derived from the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. They also incorporate local management objectives at the park level that take into account the significance, integrity, condition of the landscape, as well as goals for natural resource protection, interpretation, and visitor use. Park planning processes often involve local communities, traditionally associated people, and other stakeholders. A typical on-the-ground management scenario for a park cultural landscape is for maintenance to be performed by NPS crews or service contractors trained in general maintenance, groundskeeping, and horticulture. Routine maintenance must be funded by each park's base funds, but work needed less than once a year is funded competitively based on the merit of project proposals. Resource managers in parks or regional offices collaborate with park facility managers on project proposals, and they are guided by cultural landscape specialists and various management plans. The prioritization of our limited project funds favors parks with the most significant cultural landscapes and the most knowledgeable staff that command the most assistance from regional offices. Cultural landscapes that are regarded as less significant, perhaps on the state or local level, rather than national level, level and that are located in one of many parks that are understaffed, compete less well for project funding. National Park Service staff translates CLIs and CLRs and other plans into a series of cyclic preservation maintenance activities that strengthen the historic character of the landscape while attempting to respond to change. For example, at the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial in St. Louis, Missouri, guidance provided by the Cultural Landscape Inventory and the Cultural Landscape Report is translated into an array of maintenance activities that preserve the historic design of the landscape created by modernist landscape architect Dan Kiley with the National Park Service in the 1960s. A major part of the routine maintenance includes lawn maintenance, mowing, irrigation, fertilizing, aerating, and annual overseeding. And other routine maintenance activities include pond cleaning, disease, pest and disease control, weeding, maintenance of tree grates, pathways, and furnishings. And less than once a year projects that are competitively funded include tree and shrub pruning, mulching plant beds, making structural repairs and periodic replanting. In another park example, here at Manzanar National Historic Site in the Owens Valley of California, 
Part of the routine maintenance involves daily inspections of the irrigation system, the drip irrigation system, and I hope you can see this drip line around this tree. And the drip irrigation system helps to keep the historic fruit trees alive. In this desert landscape, thirsty coyotes and other mammals bite into the drip lines at night, causing leaks that inundate some trees while droughting others, threatening the survival of these historic orchards that date back to the time of the Japanese American internment camp during the Second World War. Here, maintenance projects include winter or summer pruning of pear, apple, peach, apricot, and fig trees in the style of orchard trees prior to the modern era to perpetuate the historic character of these orchards. And the harvested fruits are offered freely to visitors in the visitor center. As at Manzanar, in many cultural landscapes owned by the MPS, the cultures of the landscapes we preserve and commemorate are no longer present. Cultures have left as a result of socio-economic or environmental change, or due to the ephemeral nature of historic events for which the landscape is significant. In many cultural landscapes, people were physically removed to allow for the management of the land by the federal government. In one well-known example, at Shenandoah National Park in Virginia, settlers were removed from the Shenandoah Valley in the 1930s with the aim of restoring pristine scenery. In the majority of cultural landscapes preserved for significant events, all that remains of traditional use is a cultural imprint on the land. This absence is palpable at Big Hole National Battlefield in Montana the site of an armed conflict between the Nez Perce people and the US Army in 1877. Or at Ellis Island National Monument in New Jersey, the gateway to America for more than 12 million immigrants between 1892 and 1924. And vernacular landscapes, significant for historic use rather than for their design or an event, pose some of the greatest challenges for on-the-ground management. In these landscapes, the National Park Service is challenged to continue their use in order to perpetuate significance, despite the loss of traditionally associated people. As we've seen in the last two days, National Park Service cultural landscapes exist in a myriad of types. They range from prehistoric to contemporary, from designed to vernacular, from less than one acre in size to hundreds of thousands of acres. They are held under a variety of ownership and management scenarios, with some scenarios being more conducive to, to continued traditional use than others, and others which are more restrictive essentially lead this MPS to simulate historic land uses to preserve the historic character of the land. But even in parks with narrowly defined enabling legislation, the National Park Service has a number of tools to enrich the landscape with authentic or compatible uses that support on the ground management. And these tools include cooperative agreements, special use permits, lease agreements, and of course, partnerships. And in newer parks, typically those created in the last 50 years National Park Service ownership is often less than exclusive, but involves co-ownership or cooperative management. And parks without exclusive federal ownership often have more traditional and contemporary cultures actively managing cultural landscapes, such as at Canyon de Chez National Monument, has already been mentioned, where the land is owned by the Navajo Nation, but cooperatively managed through an agreement with the National Park Service. Approximately 40 Navajo families continue to live and farm within the bounds of the National Park and provide interpretive tours for visitors. And in another example of a park managed through a cooperative agreement, Kalapapa National Park on the Hawaiian island of Malakai, in this park almost none of the lands again are owned by the National Park Service. 
The park's cultural landscapes, which were set aside to commemorate the forced isolation of people afflicted with Hansen's disease, also known as leprosy, from 1866 to 1969, lands are owned by the Department of Hawaiian Homelands and the state of Hawaii, among others. The Kalapapa settlement is still home to se several patients surviving Hansen's disease, along with their families. If we look at special use permits, these allow for short-term activities in parks that provide a benefit to an individual, a group, or an organization not sponsored by the MPS. And permitted activities must not have a negative impact on park resources. And in some cases, as we'll see, special uses can directly support resource preservation. For example, at the San Antonio Missions National Historical Park in San Antonio, which you've already held, heard about in a World Heritage context in Texas, the four mission churches dating to the 1700s are active Catholic parishes and are still used to hold regular services. But outside of service times, these missions are open for park visitors. And the special use of the four missions as churches actively supports the preservation of the historic character of these properties. In another example, at Cane River Creole National Historical Park near Nach Natchitoches, Louisiana, two cultural landscapes in this park are set aside to preserve French Creole cotton plantations dating prior to the Civil War. And here, an annual Creole music festival is a special use activity that brings the traditional sounds of Creole music back into the plantation landscape, enriching the experience for park visitors. And lease agreements, these allow for long-term activities that provide a benefit to an individual, a group, or an organization. And these have a direct benefit to resource preservation or interpretation. And the long-term activity must fit with the park's enabling legislation and comply with a suite of statutes and policies. And a lease agreement for agriculture is permitted where agriculture activities perpetuate the historic use of a cultural landscape or where agriculture is an interpretive tool or exhibit. And one such example of an agricultural lease agreement is at Hubble Trading Post National Historic Site in Ganado, Arizona where the National Park Service land is leased to the local Ganado Navajo people to recreate the traditional agricultural uses of the land in the oldest Navajo trading post in the country. There's a farm plan that outlines the goals to be met in preserving the historic irrigation system and the lateral field terraces, along with the traditional crops and livestock to be raised on the land. And the agricultural leases have not only restored the appearance of the cultural landscape at the Hubble Trading Post, but have also reconnected Navajo people with their agricultural heritage. And in the best scenarios of on-the-ground management by traditionally associated people that no longer own the land, the National Park Service recruits traditionally associated people or develops partnerships with them to perpetuate historic character through traditional skills and knowledge. And this may include traditional land uses, traditional building crafts, and traditional ceremonies. For example, here at Koloko Honokohau National Historical Park on the Big Island of Hawaii, local Haw native Hawaiians continually rebuild the walls of ancient fish ponds using highly skilled dry stone masonry. And this park was set aside to preserve the natural and cultural landscapes of native Hawaiian culture and includes a series of aquaculture fish ponds for traditional fish harvest. And the National Park Service recruits native Hawaiian masons and youth apprentices to work on the maintenance of the fish pond walls that are frequently damaged by Pacific storms. And through these rebuilding activities, the integrity of the cultural landscape is preserved and the traditional knowledge of this ancient craft is passed from generation to generation. Similarly, at another park on the Kona coast of the Big 
Island, Puukohola Heiau National Historic Site. The National Park Service engages Native Hawaiian partners and volunteers to restore the Heiau masonry and to demonstrate traditional crafts to park visitors. So the National Park Service has a, a spectrum of legal tools to preserve cultural landscapes through on the ground management by traditionally associated people or through historic or contemporary compatible uses. The challenge is for park managers to have excellent resource data on hand to inform the use of these legal tools in the engagement of partners. Preservation through traditional use is a relatively untapped strategy in the National Park Service Cultural Landscapes Toolbox. But in light of the enormous National Park Service challenge to preserve cultural landscapes in perpetuity, despite great forces of socioeconomic and environmental change, adaptive and cooperative management is an approach that is yielding multiple benefits. Not only does the return of traditional users preserve the historic character and increase the authenticity of cultural landscapes, it also vastly extends the sustainability of social and cultural relevance. Ultimately, these tools may present the best chances for landscape preservation in perpetuity through the perpetuation of traditional knowledge and cultural associations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. That was a wonderful overview of what I suppose to a beginner could seem like strict codes of the US Park Service with their guidelines, but being able to show us how the leases, etc. I mean, a wonderful suite of practical examples. Thank you.